Good afternoon and welcome to the Office of Tax Appeals, also known by its initials OTA. My name is Andrew Wong. I'm the Lead Administrative Law Judge, or ALJ, who will be conducting the oral hearing for this case. On today's panel, in addition to myself, we have Judges Andrew Kui and Daniel Cho. Also present is our stenographer, Ms. Lynn Alonzo. This hearing is being conducted in person in Cerritos, California. It is being live streamed to the public and a video recording will be made available on OTA's YouTube channel. Our stenographer, Ms. Alonzo, will report this hearing verbatim and prepare an official hearing transcript, which will be made available on OTA's website. To help Ms. Alonzo make a clear record, I have three requests. Number one, please speak clearly and directly into your microphone. Number two, please do not speak over each other or interrupt when someone else is speaking. And number three, please answer verbally. Uh, nodding the head and shaking the head does not show up well on the transcript and it's not clear what you're uh, communicating. If a Miss Alonzo cannot hear, understand or identify someone who is speaking, she, can, she has permission to interrupt the oral hearing at any time to get clarification. Uh, I would like to clarify that this oral hearing is before OTA, which is a separate agency from the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, or CDTFA. OTA is not a court, but is an independent appeals body. OTA is staffed by tax experts and is independent of the state's tax agencies. As I noted earlier, I am the lead ALJ for purposes of conducting this oral hearing. However, my co-panelists and I are co-equal decision makers and may ask questions of either party during the hearing at any time. Further, our panel of three ALJs will decide all the issues presented to us and each of us will have an equal vote in making those decisions. Now, who is here for appellant? Paul. Could you please turn on your mic? Paul Azir. Thank you. Thank and who's you. here for CDTFA? Nalan Samaravikrama. Jason Parker. Chad Backus. Thank you. When we go on the record, I will be asking you to identify yourselves again. Uh, now, for the issues that we are considering today, I have one, possibly two issues. The first issue is whether a reduction to the amount of unreported taxable sales is warranted. Is that correct, Mr. Azir? Yes. Okay. CDTFA, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, there was a second potential issue regarding uh, unreported sales of fixtures and equipment. Is that an issue, Mr. Azir? For now, we, we say no. No issues. Okay. For now, what does that mean? Be because the escrow holds $16,000 for California Department of Tax and Fees. Okay. So it's not an issue for this hearing? Is that correct? It, it, it's not an issue for this hearing. Okay. So we can exclude this one. Okay. Thank you. So that's not an issue. So we just have one issue uh, today. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Azir, you proposed exhibits one through nine. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. CDTFA, did you have any objections to those documents? No objection. Okay. Mr. Azir, you had no other uh, exhibits or documents you wanted to submit? No more exhibits. Okay. Thank you. And CDT, uh, CDTFA proposed exhibits A through G. Is that correct? No. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes. yes, sorry. Okay. Um, and appellant, or Mr. Azir, did you have any objections to those proposed exhibits? I do have uh, some objection, but not of them in, 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 in the material and in the facts there. And I will go through that during the hearing. So you can, so you have an objection to what? The accuracy, their accuracy? Accuracy, yeah. Okay. Descriptions but, is, uh, I see. is okay. not correct, yes. But as you don't have objections to like, it's improper or anything, like the documents themselves can be submitted as evidence. Uh, the documents themselves versus what they mean, they're two different things, is that correct? Uh, no objection, but no, objection okay. in the method and the calculations. Oh, right, the got it, yeah. okay. So no objection to the proposed exhibits to be admitted. Okay. At CDTFA, you have no other documents to be submitted, is that correct? We don't. Okay. And then, um, Mr. Zier, you have no witnesses today? No. Okay. And CDTFA, you have no witnesses today? No witnesses. Okay. Uh, 
it was anticipated that this oral hearing would take approximately 65 minutes. Um, you, Mr. Azir, you had asked for about 30 minutes, 15 minutes for your opening, and then 15 minutes for your rebuttal and closing. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Maybe he, more, maybe less. It's, it's that's, an estimate. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Uh, this is the only uh, hearing for this session, and so we have some room. So. Thank you. Uh, and CDTFA, you have asked for 20 minutes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Great. Any final questions before we go on the record? Uh, Mr. Zier, any final questions? No, thank you. Okay. And CDTFA, any final questions? No questions. Okay. There you go. Oops. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Zier, before we go on the record, um, during your presentation, would you mind bringing the mic microphone closer to your mouth when you're speaking? Uh, sure. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right, we are now going on the record. We're opening the record in the appeal of Boutros before the Office of Tax Appeals. This is OTA case number 19105370. Today is Tuesday, May 17th, 2022. The time is 1.06 p.m. We are holding this hearing in person in Cerritos, California. I am Lead Administrative Law Judge Andrew Wong, and with me today are Judges Andrew Kui and Daniel Cho. We are the panel hearing and deciding this case. Uh, individuals representing uh, the appellant, please identify yourselves. Paul Azier. Thank you. Thank you. Individuals representing the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, which I will refer to as, by, as CDTFA, please identify yourselves. Nalan Samarikrama. Jason Parker. Chad Backus. Thank you. We are considering one issue today, whether a reduction to the amount of unreported taxable sales is warranted. Is that correct, Mr. Azir? Yes. Thank you. CDTFA, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Appellant has identified and submitted proposed exhibits one through nine as evidence uh, and has no other exhibits to offer as evidence. CDTFA had no objections to them. Is that correct, CDTFA? Yes. Okay. And therefore, appellants exhibits one through nine will be admitted into the record as evidence. CDT CDTFA has identified and submitted proposed exhibits A through G as evidence. They had no other exhibits to offer as evidence, and appellant had no objections to them. Is that correct, Mr. Azir? Yes. Thank you. Therefore, CDTFA's exhibits A through G will be admitted into the record as evidence. And neither party had any witnesses. All right. So, Mr. Azir, uh, let's start with your presentation. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Hi, owners. Uh, I go for page five from uh, California Department of Tax and Fees, and they have the descriptions for the business, and we will find several mistakes. Let me read what the auditor said. Sole proprietorship owner, Fadi G. Potros, started date 7-11, 7 uh, and CO date 2 15 2016 no buyer audits it had this uh, discount cigarette had a buyer audit before not with the same owner M uh, discount cigarette market is a liquor store it's not a liquor store they don't have a liquor license that sells cigarettes beer carbonated and non-carbonated beverages snacks sun dairy items and lotteries and other items, or very important items, is cashing checks. Business accept both cash and credit card, card payments. It located in 9465 Fort Hill Boulevard, Rancho Cucamonga, in a shopping center plaza, where is other several business. It's open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week. The store has about 1,000 to 12 hundred square feet retail place. Another mistake, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. That's not accurate. And then we back for my evidence here. We provide so many evidence for the auditors and several times and several occasions. First one in my exhibit one, check cashing 
permits. Uh, it's more than one permit, several permits for several years, and the auditor ignore all the permits. In my exhibit number four, bank statement for three years, for 12 months each year, and each month showing cashing checks, not even one transaction, several transactions, hundreds of transactions probably monthly, thousands of transactions annually. All of them has been ignored by California Department of Tax and Fees. That's second thing. Not even that. We provide copies of the checks has been cashed with the bank, and we record it from the bank, Wells Fargo, and it's showing it has been cashed. And at, at the auditor, for unknown reason, ignore all of those in calculation of cost of goods sold. And the cost of goods sold when discount cigarette buy the checks from the customers, they purchase that and must be recorded as a cost of goods sold. And the markup for the cashing checks, as Dr. Botros said in his witness, in his uh, written statement, and he already apologized, he can't be here today for his board exam in Arizona. He's a medical doctor. At this period, from the period of the audit, he was a student. And I like to be that he was a student in medical school. And he does that as a part-time to help him as his expenses. And he as, has a big loan. And we did provide the loan as an evidence uh, 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 in, uh, in my exhibit, exhibit number six, student loan evidence showing Dr. Botros at this period was an evidence and he has several loans. And then we provide all the documents for the cashing checks. And for unknown reason, California Department of Tax and Fees ignore all of them. And it is one bank account, and that's how it is. And, I, uh, and, 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 and the taxpayer and I, we don't know why. And we try to do that. And we ask even if he doesn't like to use this method, which is absolutely wrong, he can use the markup test, which the other auditor did for the same location before. And they consider all the cash checks from all the evidence has been happened. Um, we, we, uh, we went for the settlement department, and the settlement department, the auditor, she did a great job, and she offered us the max. And I think it's about $30,000, $38,000, but the taxpayer, they said, no, he doesn't owe California Department of Tax and Fees about that much, 30000 So we don't have any other reason except to go for a bill. And before that, uh, 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 California Department of Tax and Fees, they ask because we provide so many evidence and it has been all of them ignored by auditor. And they request from the auditor uh, uh, to re-audit again. But the auditor keep ignoring thousands of documents and thousands of documents from different sources like bank, which is totally independent source. No one can deny that. And they ignore uh, 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 the, the permits issues from the uh, state of California for cashing the checks. And he ignored the bank statement. And he ignored the checks written by different customers, hundreds of them, hundreds of customers' owners, hundreds of customers' owners has been denied attentionally from California Department Tax and Fees. Has been denied several times, several occasions. I have no idea why. I did handle so many audits before with California Department of Tax and Fees for that location and other locations, and was very reasonable auditors. But this case is a little bit unique case. And uh, 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 and the taxpayer was completely surprising, and he was very upset with the decision several times. The taxpayer was completely saying that's very unfair, very very unfair. The auditor can probably has a doubt about one document, but I haven't seen someone has a doubt about thousands of documents.
And that's included in his calculations. And built in this, everything almost done wrong in the calculation. And he said the markup test 11% is not reasonable, etc., because he ignored these facts. And, uh, and we are here in front of owners, and I believe this, this case can be end zero taxes as a taxpayer believes. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you, Mr. Zier. <clears throat> now I'll turn to my co-panelists to see if they have any questions for you, starting with Judge Kui. Judge Kui had no questions at this time. Uh, Judge Cho, you. did you have any questions for uh, Mr. Azir? Uh, I don't have any questions at this time either. Thank you. Thank you. I also didn't have any questions at this time. So thank you. We are now uh, turned to CDTFA for their presentation. Uh, you have 20 minutes. Thank you. Pellant operated a store selling cigarettes cigarette-related products, beer, wine, carbonated beverages, miscellaneous taxable items, non-carbonated beverages, and other non-taxable items in Rancho Cucamonga, California. In addition, Pellant also sold lottery tickets, money orders, and provided check cashing services to his customers. The department audited Pellant's business for the period of January 1st, 2013 through February 5th, 2016. During the audit period, Pellant reported around 1.3 million in total sales and claimed various types of deductions resulting in reported taxable sale of around 309,000 and that will be on your exhibit A pages 16 and 17. During my presentation I will explain why the department rejected Pellon's reported taxable sales, why the department used an indirect audit approach and how the department determined Pellon's unreported sales tax for the audit period. During the audit, Pellon failed to provide sufficient sales records. Pellon did not provide complete cash register tapes, copies of U.S. Department of Agriculture food stamp statements, copies of electronic benefit transfer program statements, sales journals or sales summaries to support his reported sales for the audit period. In addition, Pellant failed to provide complete purchase invoices or purchase journals for the audit period. Pellant was unable to explain how he reported his sales on its sales and use tax returns. Pellant was also unable to explain what sources he relied upon to complete his sales and use tax returns. The department did not accept Pellon's reported taxable sales due to lack of reliable records and low reported book markups. It was also determined that Pellon's record was such that sales could not be verified by a direct audit approach. Therefore, the department estimated sales using cost plus markup method to determine unreported sales tax for the audit period. The department completed four verification methods to verify the reasonableness of Pellon's reported total and taxable sales. First, the department reviewed Pellon's federal income tax returns and noted low recorded net income of around $3,400 for year 2013 and $5,000 for year 2014. And that will be on your exhibit B, pages 16 and 17. 
page 83. The amounts claimed for wages also appeared low for a business operating seven days a week. And that will be on your Exhibit B, page 83. This analysis reveal that the amount of total sales and reported total expenses are likely understated. Second, the department reviewed the profit and loss statements for years 2013 and 2014 and noted that the recorded cost of goods sold was same as the cost of goods sold reflected on Pellon's federal income tax return for the same periods. However, these costs were not categorized by type, such as taxable or non-taxable merchandise. Therefore, the department compared reported total sale of around 1 million to cost of goods sold of around 931,000 reflected on Pellon's federal income tax returns and calculated an overall reported book markup of around 10%, which is low for this type of store, and that will be on your Exhibit B, page 94. Based on the types of items sold, customer base, and the location of the store, the department expected to see a markup higher than the reported book markup. Accordingly, the department did not accept Pellon's reported total sales for the audit period. Third, Pellon only provide bank statement for year 2015. The department conducted a bank reconciliation comparing Pellon's bank deposits to its reported total sales. From January 2015, through December 2015, Pellon deposited around $355,000 but only reported total sales of around $291,000 and that will be on your Exhibit B, page 87. Thus, Pellon deposited around $64,000 more into his bank account than reported sales per sales and use tax returns. And that will be on your Exhibit B, page 87. Fourth, the department compared the reported total sales with taxable sales for the audit period and calculated the reported taxable sales percentage of around 24%. And that will be on your Exhibit B, page 88. Based on the items sold, the department expected to see a higher taxable sale percentage than the reported taxable sale percentage. This taxable sale percentage was very low for this type of a store. Accordingly, the department did not accept Pellon's reported taxable sales for the audit period. Pellant has not provided any documentation for the audit period to support Pellant's reported taxable sales. Further, during the audit and appeal process, Pellant acknowledged that it is unable to determine taxable sales percentage because Pellant did not have the information required to calculate this percentage. Pellant was unable to explain the reason for low reported book markups, excess bank deposits, and low reported taxable sale percentages. Therefore, the department conducted further investigation by analyzing Pellant's purchase information and pricing policies. Pellant did not provide purchase journals or supporting merchandise purchase invoices. The department, therefore, could not identify Pellon's vendors to obtain Pellon's purchase information. Therefore, the department used the cost of goods sold of around 
$1,000 reflected on Pellon's federal income tax returns. And that will be on your Exhibit B, page 83. The department could not perform a purchase segregation test of taxable and non-taxable merchandise purchasers because of the lack of detailed merchandise purchase records. The department thus perform a visual observation of the store shelves and determine that the non-taxable merchandise such as non-carbonated beverages and, and snacks were around 10% to 20% of the shelf space. The department used the higher non-taxable ratio of 20% to give a benefit to the parent. And the department determined a taxable merchandise purchase ratio of 80%. The department also reviewed three other similar businesses and determined that 80% was a very reasonable taxable purchase ratio to determine Pellon's taxable cost of goods sold for the audit period. The department applied the taxable merchandise purchase ratio of 80% to cost of goods sold of around $931,000 to estimate taxable cost of goods sold of around 745000 And that will be on the Exhibit B, page 78. Pellon stated he did not have any self-consumption of taxable merchandise. Thus, the department did not include an allowance for self-consumption. The department calculated the audited taxable cost of goods sold available for retail sale of around $737,000 using audited taxable cost of goods sold in a 1% shrinkage and that will be on your Exhibit B, page 78. Pellant did not provide cash register tapes and merchandise purchase invoices for the audit period and the business was sold prior to the start of the audit field work. Therefore, the department was not able to perform a shelf test. The department thus established a taxable markup based on audits of four similar businesses which had an average markup of around 35%. Therefore, the department determined that a 33% markup was reasonable given that it was close to the average markup of similar businesses in the area. Applying the markup factor of 133% to audited taxable cost of goods sold, the department estimated audited taxable sale of around $981,000. And that will be on your Exhibit B, page 78. Auditor taxable sales were compared with reported taxable sale of around $214,000 to calculate unreported taxable sale of around $766,000. And that will be on your Exhibit B, page 78. The department compared the unreported taxable sales with the reported taxable sale of around $214,000 to calculate an error rate of around 357%. And that will be on your Exhibit B, page 78. The department applied the error rate of around 357% to report a taxable sale of around $309,000 for the period January 1st, 2013 to December 31st, 2015 to calculate unreported taxable sale of around $1.1 million for the same period. Pellon did not file sales and use tax return for the period January 1st, 2016 through the closeout date of February 5th, 2016. The department computed the average daily Auditor taxable sale of around 
$1,300 using audited sale of around $981,000. And that will be on the Exhibit B, page 77. The department then determined audited taxable sale of around $47,000 for the period January 1, 2016 to February 4, 2016. And that will be on the Exhibit B, page 77. In total, the department calculated total unreported taxable sale of around $1.2 million for the audit period. And that will be on the Exhibit A page 21. Then the department compared the total unreported taxable sales with the reported taxable sale of around $309,000 to compute the overall error rate of around 373% for the audit period. To verify the reasonableness of, of audit finding, the department analyzed Pellon's available sales and expense information. During the audit, Pellon provided only his federal income tax returns and profit and loss statement for years 2013 and 2014. Pellon did not provide any other source documents of original entry, such as cash register tapes, purchase invoices, wage information, insurance information, utility bills, and other expense details for the audit period. Therefore, to compute average daily business expenses, the department relied on reported expenses on Pellon's federal income tax return, and that will be on your Exhibit B, page 93. The department reviewed Pellon 2013 and 2014 federal income tax returns and found Pellon did not report enough daily sales to cover his daily expenses. In 2013, the ratio of daily expenses to reported daily sales was 99%, and in 2014, it was 101%. This shows that Pellon reported daily sales are not sufficient to cover his reported daily expenses for years. 2013 and 2014. This is an indication that Pellon did not report all his sales on its sales and use tax return for the audit period. The department also noted insurance expenses, wages and wage related expenses were not accurately reflected in Pellon's federal income tax returns and that will be on the exhibit B page 93. A similar analysis was made comparing daily expenses to average audited daily sales. In 2013, the ratio of daily expenses to audited daily sales was 94%, and in 2014, it was 70%. Based on these analyses, the department concluded that the audited taxable sales were reasonable and was in Pellon's favor, and that will be on your Exhibit B, page 93. As mentioned earlier, Pellon did not provide complete source documentation, such as complete cash register tapes, copies of USDA food stamp statements, copies of EBT program statements. Pellon did not provide complete purchase invoices, Pellon failed to provide documentary evidence to support his taxable sales for the audit period. The department was unable to verify the accuracy of reported sales tax using a direct audit method. Therefore, an alternative audit method was used to determine unreported sales tax. Accordingly, the department determined the unreported sales tax based upon the best available information. The evidence shows that the audit produced fair and reasonable results. Pellon believes that he is entitled to additional adjustments to the audit findings. As support, Pellon provided a check cash permit from the Department of Justice. 
previous owner's food stamp program permit from U.S. Department of Agriculture. Loan documents, Form 1099 from California State Lottery for years 2013, 2014 and 2015. Some bank statements, copies of check cash for customers. Multiple spreadsheets for year 2015 and a declaration and that will be on your Exhibit 1 through Exhibit 8. Pellant also provides some purchase information from some vendors and that will be on your Exhibit 9. The department reviewed and analyzed this information but ultimately determined that the information did not support a reduction to the tax liability. Upon examination of Pellant's provided information, the department noted that none of the information provided support any adjustment to the taxable cost of goods sold for years 2013 and 2014. Pellant failed Mr. to... Summer, Rema, your time is up. If you could like wrap it up in maybe a minute or two. All right. Thank you. Okay. Pellant failed to support with documentary evidence that the cost of goods sold amount reflected on Pellant's federal income tax return include other expenses not related to cost of merchandise sold. Absent of complete and reliable documentary information, Pellant is unable to support that the cost of goods sold reflected on Pellant's federal income tax return include other expenses not related to cost of merchandise sold. Pellant also believes that the audited taxable sales include income from check cashing service and lottery ticket sales. The department rejects this contention as a calculation method used cost of goods sold as a basis for all calculations rather than determining sales based on bank statements or other income amounts. Pellant has not provided any reasonable documentation or evidence to support an adjustment to the audit finding. Therefore, the department requests the appeal be denied. This concludes my presentation and I am available to answer any questions the panel may have. Thank you. Thank you. I will turn to my panel for any questions that they might have for CDTFA, starting with Judge Kui. Uh, this is Judge Kui. Uh, yes, I did have uh, maybe one or two questions. Um, so in looking at the audit, it looks like CDTFA picked up approximately 1.1, 1.2 million in unreported taxable sales. Uh, you know, if you consider the uh, reported taxable sales of $300,000, that brings you to maybe audited taxable sales of approximately 1.5 um, million. And then if you consider, you know, total sales uh, during the period, that would bring you up to total sales maybe of around 1.8 million. But during the uh, audit period, looks like uh, the taxpayer only reported approximately an even 1 million in total sales to CDTFA and uh, approximately the same plus or minus $7,000 to the IRS. So essentially, I guess what I'm getting at is this, um, audit is picking up approximately $800,000 in additional um, total sales income and gross receipts that, that weren't reported to CDTFA or to, to the IRS. And I'm just wondering, you know, for, for a, a business that only reported approximately what, 1 million to begin with, is that maybe overcompensating the amount of um, additional income for, for the business? That seems kind of high um, considering you're saying, you know, looking at the bank receipts, there's uh, you know some underreporting, but then that that ratio of uh, of the you know what was reported versus the the income being picked up in the bank deposits, it seemed like that ratio was a lot less than what is you know what I'm noting here of approximately an eighty percent uh, of the uh, reported total sales. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Right. Uh, the, the the this audit is uh, based on the cost plus markup method. And uh, the purchase, uh, the cost of goods sold for two years is nine, uh, 2013 and 14 is nine hundred and eighty-one thousand dollars. And uh, the uh, and if we if we use uh, the 33 percent markup, it comes to one point 
1.5 million and uh, the uh, and we believe that uh, the the percentage that we use for taxable and non taxable percent the purchase aggregate according to we were unable to do a purchase aggregation but th that's the reason we use 80 percent and if we make adjustment uh, for uh, 80 per, like if you if you assume that the 80 percent is taxable and apply that percentage to the uh, cost of goods sold of 981 and uh, that's the that's the number that we have and also uh, we also uh, review the uh, taxpayers uh, I mean Pellen's uh, federal income tax return for 2013 and 2014 the the daily and uh, when we when we when the department consider the total sales total audited sales we estimated additional non taxable sales by applying same ratio of 20% and by applying is 99% uh auditor is 96% and we still believe that is not is not reasonable and also if you check 2014 is 78% 78% uh, total, uh, total, uh, uh, total uh, daily expenses. Total, sorry, total daily expenses to to audited sales. So based on that, we believe that the estimate that we ha we determine for this audit is reasonable. And uh, you know the tax uh, the appellants. One of the arguments is like uh, ca check cashing. Uh, you know, it's only a small percentage. Like for example, if you if uh, if a uh, a uh, customer comes with a hundred dollar check, and uh, they only cash for like a ninety five, ninety seven, depending on the percentage. Uh, so it's is a very uh, even. You know the cost of goods sold can't be include the uh, cost of those checks. You know the basically the double entry for that is if you're cashing a check, you know it goes to the bank and, and also the fees. And uh, we, the, the based on the information we have, the department believe that we came up with a reasonable estimating after considering whatever the the parent reported for uh, federal income tax returns. Uh, thank you, and and I do understand the concern with the reported amounts. I guess I was just trying to consider the totality of the circumstances and whether the upward limit was also reasonable. Um, but in getting at that, it looks like. Um, I guess one of the mo most potentially questionable aspects was determining that 20 percent, um, 80, 20 percent based on the shelf space. It seemed right, um, and and you know you you had the you know starting inventory plus the purchases less the ending inventory to get the cost of goods sold, and then you mu multiplied, or I guess allocated you know 20 percent to non-taxable, 80 percent to taxable. And I, I'm just curious when in doing that that calculation, you know, is it clear what um, was included in the you know the taxable purchases like for example they did the check cashing, they did the um, uh, lottery sales um, stuff like that like you know wouldn't have necessarily taken up much as shelf space but is that something that would have inc been included in their in their purchases that should be considered too or is that not something that's included in their purchases like I guess in in going over that ratio I'm just trying to figure out how reasonable that 20% marker is, you know, because if you moved it, it would potentially make a significant impact on on the liability. Um, and I'm just wondering what thought went into into considering what was included in the purchases or if we, if we were able to determine, you know, uh, some basis to determine what was in there besides just the eyeball in the shelf space. Yeah, so the the uh, w when the department says 80 percent 20 percent ratio is only relates to the tangible personal property is it doesn't consider the check cash in income or check cash in cost because it doesn't go to the cost of goods sold and also the lottery is a the uh, the the lottery cost there is no lottery cost uh, is, a, is a commission but if the taxpayer have information to show that the cost of goods sold of 981,000 for two years include that type of uh, cost if there is any 
yeah then we can have a look but the reason we use uh, 80 percent 20 is because we didn't have the department did not have the information to compute the real uh, taxable purchase ratio and uh, uh, we, uh, the department is also reviewed three uh, three similar businesses one the taxable ratio was 82 percent the other one is 72 percent and the third one is 86 and the, the average was a little close to 81 percent so based on that we believe 80 percent is reasonable unless the taxpayer can show that uh, the cost of goods sold include any any cost relating to the check cash uh, check cashing or lotto then we we can make an adjustment is very uh, we, we we the department did not receive such information to consider and uh, the department continues to believe that 80 percent is taxable merchandise and the 20 percent represent non-taxable merchandise like non-carbonated beverages, snacks, and uh, it didn't take uh, uh, the check cashing income or the lotto uh, cost into that formula. And generally speaking, um, with cost of goods sold, lotto and check cashing would not be included in there. So those are not the merchandise that's sold. With the lotto, it's typically a commission with the check cashing, it's a fee, so there's no purchase of anything. So we typically don't see those amounts in there. So we would reasonably assume that they don't include those amounts in the cost of goods sold. And that's why we've looked to see have they provided anything that shows that those amounts are included in there, which we haven't received. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is Judge Kui. So I'll turn it back to Andrew Wong. I guess at some point I'd like to just offer a Palance representative the opportunity to, though, to, to comment on, on that aspect if, if he wants to. But I'll, for now, I'll turn it back to you for questions. Oh, um, yeah, well, I guess if it's not going to interrupt, the, I would turn it over to a Palance representative if you would like to comment on that about whether or not um, there was evidence that the lotto um, and the check cashing expenses were included in, in the purchases reported on the federal income tax returns, or if you have a position on that? Thank you. Actually, I have a lot of comments, and I try to be probably in my time. I don't want to spend more than 15 minutes because I need hours, really. Uh, number one here uh, in my exhibit with the Excel worksheet, we showing one month, month of January 2015, the total cashing check deposit is $17,563.28. And we did present it to California Department of Tax and Fees, and we did present it to uh, the court. And the total deposit is 25229273 So we're talking about probably 80% from the cost of goods sold, it is cashing checks. And that's number one. Number two... When we go for Schedule C from uh, Form 11, uh, Form 1040, Income Tax Return, under Internal Revenue Service, which is uh, Profit and Loss for Business, which is the auditor incorrectly using this one, the cost of goods sold, it can be reported there as buying, as the store buying the checks, from people, so that's part of the cost because he buy it and he sell it again to the bank. So it is cost of merchandise. If our business involved in cash and checks, so we sell cash. We sell we sell checks. We buy it from the customers and we sell it to the bank. So absolutely, it's reported correctly. About the lottery. We just report the commission. So the auditor, when he confused between the lottery and cashing the checks, it is. And that's evidence number probably seven or nine. And here in each bank, you find it there. Cashing checks went to the bank, went direct to the bank, and no other way to go. Because no one else, you can cash the checks except the bank. And, uh, 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 and 
it's thousands of transactions. When the California Department of Tax and Fees is saying they calculate small percentage or some percentage, no, it's a huge percentage. One example, 17,000 to 25,000. And we did complete this one in Excel for uh, uh, my exhibit number uh, eight. It's showing, it's showing we don't, the taxpayer doesn't owe any money if you add the cash in the checks. It's not prohibited under Internal Revenue Code to report it as a cost of goods sold. It's not prohibited, again, in Schedule C to report cashing checks under cost of goods sold. Because you buy check and you sell the checks. You buy it from customers with a discount and you see it from Dr. Potros' statement from 1% to 3%. That's why we have the cost of goods sold there. And that's lead us for evidence number three. California Department of Tax and Fees, they use wrong four, which is Schedule C, to calculate there is evidence. Evidence number four, or five in my list, California Department of Tax and Fees refuse to use other methods like credit card method. I ask the auditor, we can use different method. Auditor saying the taxpayer didn't provide any documents. Taxpayers provide thousands of documents and thousands of documents. Mr. I'm sorry. Mr. Zier, I think you answered uh, Judge Kui's question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, it's not my presentation. I'm sorry. No, 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 well, no. I think that's my presentation. That's oh, fine. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you ask the question again? Or I did answer it. <laughs> oh, this is Judge Kui, and I believe you answered the question. Um, I believe your answer was that the lottery was not included in the cost of goods sold because it was reported as commission, but the check cashing uh, was reported in the cost of goods sold and should be considered, um, and that was the explanation for the difference. Um, if, if that summarizes briefly what uh, you just said. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. You. Uh, you will have a chance to finish your sure. rebuttal. Uh, Judge Kui, did you have any other questions for uh, CDTFA? This is Judge Kui. I do not have any further questions for CDTFA. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll turn to Judge Cho for any questions for CDTFA. Just a, one quick question for clarifying purposes. Um, I just wanted to confirm, but it's CDTFA, you're saying that the way you determined the 33% markup was based on an analysis of, I, I believe, four businesses, in, four businesses in that area. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, and is that data anywhere in the auto working papers or the exhibits that you provided? Yeah, it's, uh, it is not because in order to uh, protect the confidentiality of the other taxpayers, uh, we didn't, uh, the department did not include, uh, but uh, based, on, uh, based on that uh, four other businesses, one, the taxable markup for one was 45, Percent, another one is thirty-five percent, the third one is thirty-three th percent, and the fourth one is twenty-eight percent. So average came up to thirty-five percent, and uh, the for the audit, the department used thirty-three. So uh, we, the department, did not include uh, that spreadsheet because uh, it was confidential and. Uh, uh, but we analyzed four business, uh, four different markups in that area. Okay, thank you. And I, and I believe that's in preparation for today's hearing, correct? Because according to the auto working papers, if you look at page 79 of your exhibit file, it says note three, taxable markup of 33% is used to calculate the audited taxable sales the percentage is based on personal auditor experience of doing audits for the similar size and type of the business. So that, that seems to be a little different than what you've just said today. The, uh, according to the audit folder, uh, we have a schedule, uh, we, we, I, uh, the, I saw a schedule listing that four, uh, 
four stores but for preparation for this hearing I use the same uh, four uh, businesses and compute the purchase rate segregation 80 percent so in you know I compute the the, the department compute the eight uh, you know check the purchase uh, purchase whether the uh, taxable ratio is using using the same information but uh, that is that information came during the preparation for this hearing but not the the uh, markup okay yeah. so when the audit was conducted the 33 percent was based off of the auditor's experience is that correct the uh, based on the experience as well as the other available information like when the department filed the opening brief, the department submitted the Excel folder, and uh, if you if you look if you check if you if, if you check that folder, then you will see that schedule. But when we submit the uh, peer in conference statement and include the uh, the expert, you know, we didn't include that. So just just to clarify. Um, the spreadsheet that he is referring to that has the markup percentages of the four other businesses was prepared prior to and and was included redacted in the audit folder um, and so it wasn't this wasn't pulled from businesses for the purpose of the of the hearing this was prepared by the auditor so her personal experience uh, Reference these businesses that were audited for a similar audit period, and are similar types of businesses in the in in the same regional area. Okay, I think that answers my question. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to clarify. So the comparison for the thirty three percent markup was done not in preparation for the hearing, but was done by the auditor. Is that, that is correct. But the comparison of the three other businesses, as far as the eighty percent, twenty percent non-taxable, taxable non-taxable ratio, was for this. Yes. Here. Okay. Is there any overlap between those businesses? Just curious. Uh, I didn't understand the question. Are the four businesses that the auditor used the same, and same as the three businesses that you used? In preparation for this hearing. Yeah. So the reason I didn't have I, I didn't have the information to compute the uh, taxable ratio from one business, so that's the reason uh, I uh, I said uh, it's three businesses, and uh, compute uh, the ver verify whether the eighty percent is reasonable. Same same four businesses, but one the department did not have the information to compute uh, taxable ratio. Got it. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Azir had at the beginning of his presentation had took issue with uh, the department's characters, characterization or description of this business, saying it's not a liquor store. So like, how would you, how would the CDTFA characterize the business? Uh, this is a store selling uh, cigarette-related products, and the name, uh, you know, uh, describes that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't uh, affect the computation of the unreported taxable sales. Thank you. Yeah. May I, owner, may I ask a question for common? Does um, the court allow me? They are just making arguments, so you can't ask them questions directly. But if you would like to pose your question to the panel, and if sure. you deem it uh, that the answer would be probative or useful, then we could pose it to CDTFA. So why don't you? What question did you have? Sure. Do the all four businesses? have cash in the checks and beer and wine and uh, probably close to your question does uh, i mean the, 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 do all the other businesses comparing to uh, 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 that business have cash in the checks or not that's question number one question number two uh, uh, when the auditor compare to other businesses why he doesn't compare his audit to the previous auditor for the same location for the same business done in the past. So why he refused that and he used different businesses and we have great matching apple to apple, same business, same location, same 
kind of everything and done by other auditors. And he refused that one and he used other four and I don't know anything about them. They are liquor store or not. I think the auditor confused between liquor store and beer and wine. The auditor confused between cost of gold sold, cashing, cashing checks or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I will allow that question. Um, the panel is curious about the answer to that question from CDTFA. Uh, just to let you know, after the question, uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, the panel is going to confer on something and then uh, we'll start up again. But uh, please answer the question. Um, the, uh, at this point, I we don't have the make a statement saying whether those four businesses have check cashing services for their uh, customers, but if if, you, uh, if the panel needs to verify that, we are happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, we're going to yeah, we're going to take a ten minute break. Um, panel is going to confer on uh, some issues, and we'll come back at two eleven p.m. Okay, we'll go off the record now. Thank you.
We'll start again in one minute. All right, let's go back on the record. Uh, during the break, uh, my co-panelists and I uh, conferred, and we had a question for CDTFA. Uh, would CDTFA be willing to provide either a redacted version of the spreadsheet that the auditor used to prepare the uh, estimated 33% markup, or some sort of spreadsheet with that information without that redacts any identifying information, names and whatnot. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, we would also you had also expressed willingness to um, provide some characteristics of these three or four other businesses. Um, again, we were if they had like check cashing services or lotto services and that type of information would CDFA, CDTFA be willing to provide um, char uh, the characteristics of the businesses that they compared uh, appellant to? The, the department is not adverse to, to doing so uh, if we can if we can find um, that information. We will we will look into it and okay. and provide what we can find. Great. Then at the end of the he hearing, we will won't be closing the record. We'll leave it open, and we'll um, allow CDTFA a certain amount of time to uh, to uh, provide that information. How much time do you would you need to provide that information or spreadsheet? A week is fine. A week. Okay. Mr. Azir, would you like an opportunity to respond to this uh, submission, additional submissions? Uh, I, I like California Department of Tax and Fees compare this audit to the previous auditor uh, done for the same location, for same kind of business, for accuracy. Because each business, in my opinion, needs to be evaluated individually. Uh, 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 the auditor um, he refused to compare his audit to the other auditors done for the same location same same location same kind of business same everything for previous owners and he said no buyer audit but it was audits before for discount cigarette the same location located in uh, 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 two uh, nine four six five Food Hills, Boulevard. Um, would you like an opportunity to respond to um, their submissions? Sure, but I, I, I need to review the other audit. Um, so we have to postpone today and we come other day for the decision? I'm sorry, another audit? Is there an... Uh, an uh, the, the discount, discount cigarette market, the store subject matter, has been audited by we're, our two. We're just, I think we're just talking about the audit, this audit right now. I, we don't have currently jurisdiction over a, another audit that might be appealed or anything like that. It's not a build or anything. It has been done prior to that audit for the same uh, uh, discount secret uh, by think, different auditors. I, I think and it's the, done by California Department of Tax and Fees. 
So uh, that's why it'd be the most accurate audit. I think we're just focusing on the audit and the audit method right now. And part of the audit method, they compared uh, the business at hand to others in formulating their audit results. So I think that's what we're focusing on. Right, right. about the percentage, 33 percentage. But the, my issue is the cashing checks, including in, in, in this one. If even the percentage higher or lower, it's really the most important thing that cashing checks, it has been ignored by California Department of Tax and Fees as a, cash, as a cost of goods sold. I mean, that prior audit, I don't think there's any, is there any evidence? Is that prior audit, the results of audit working papers in the record of this appeal? No, we don't have it, but the California Department of Tax and Fees have it for the same location. Well, that was a prior owner? Are you saying? Prior owner, but same same store and same activities. Uh, no know, I change. Think, I think we're, we're just focusing on this, this audit right now. So I understand, totally understand, but we could try to compare this audit to other uh, four businesses in the area. Yeah, we cannot order a re-audit. We need to just focus on this audit to see if tax is owed and if so, what the amount of that tax is. So, so we can't go... I'm not going to go back. I'm, I'm not going to focus on any audit. I'm not going to reject or anything. I'm just to use the same method done by the other auditors. Uh, because I, the audit auditors, they did audit the same store. But I think in this audit, they didn't do a comparison of this audit to, to that previous audit, only to other businesses, so I don't think we can do, do that. Allow that. Yeah. So would you like, so, but would you like an opportunity? We'll let you, give you time to respond to the submissions that they provide. All right. But I, do I have to come here again? No, no, no. It's, it's all done through uh, written submissions. Oh, written submissions. Yeah, yeah. Just, but the decision is not going to be today. The decision is not going to be today, no. Will be later. Uh, the decision will be uh, 100 days after the record is closed. Okay. But we're not closing the record today either. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I did not have any further questions for CDTFA. And so now we turn to uh, Mr. Azir for your rebuttal and closing uh, arguments, your presentation. You have 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh a few points here, I summarize everything. Uh, we see the auditor uh, compare, in our opinion, wrong businesses. We don't know yet. We're going to check that. And uh, 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 we have an audit, as I mentioned, done for this store. And with other auditor, I like if the court can look at this one, if it's available. And Schedule C, profit and loss, for business under uh, 10 for, form 1040 of Internal Revenue Code, and the cost of goods sold include cashing checks, include cashing checks. And in uh, my exhibit, where is I showing uh, the calculation, we find one month 17,000, uh, so $17,563.28 from total deposit 25,229.73. It's from cashing checks, and it's it's from the bank statement, and we provide that all the checks has been cashed by the bank, and we provide uh, 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 in Exhibit 4 the, uh, the Excel worksheet showing this one. And as I mentioned before, uh, as the auditor saying, this business collect cash and credit card payment, I ask from the auditor to use credit card percentage, and he did refuse it too. Uh, and uh, 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 discount cigarette is a not a liquor store. It's not a liquor store. And it's, they don't have a license for liquor store, and they don't sell liquor stores, period. Uh, bank statement has been ignored. And very important evidence, the auditor said several times the taxpayer didn't provide any information or summaries of sales or invoices. That's incorrect. And the evidence, where is the auditor used? And Exhibit A, Exhibit A, page 25, an email from me to Mr. Shang. And the email was on Friday, August 30, uh, 31, 2018. And I told him to see all the purchase invoices and summaries 
for 2015 because he chose 2015 as a sampling year. And he never looked at them and he never provides them. And I have a copy here if the court like to have it, the email. Um, or you can find it in page 25 in California Department of Tax and Fee Exhibit A. Uh, so really, uh, I still I don't understand why the calculation of cashing checks is not including there, which is that's the subject matter about. And it has been provided with thousands of documents. And all the documents has been ignored. And as the auditor said, it's a very small percentage applied. And I don't know why he applies small percentage of cashing checks and he doesn't apply whole percentage. I, 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 I still am very unclear in this one. And I did ask several times from California Department of Tax and Fees for this questions. If you apply small percentage, like what he said today, why you didn't apply the whole percentage? And you have it from bank statement, you have it from checks by, uh, written by individuals, thousands of individuals, and it has been cashed by the bank, provided by the third party, and provided with the cashing checks permit under California, state of California. Uh, if we calculate this one, we'll see the audit it should be no change audit. And uh, in exhibit number eight, it's, it's, uh, you will find this calculations. Uh, we make it easier for, 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 for the court. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Azir. Uh, for the final time, I will now turn to my co-panelists to see if they have any final questions uh, for you or CTFA, starting with Judge Kui. Uh, this is Judge Kui. I don't have any further questions for the parties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Cho. Uh, I don't have any questions either. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Zier, I just had one question. So in the cost of goods sold for the 2013 and 2014 federal income tax returns, that included expenses related to check cashing? Is that your uh, contention? Yes. OK. Yes when the store buy the checks, including there as a cost of goods sold. And does it also include expenses related to lottos, or is that not, it did not include? No, lotto is not including there. Okay. Who prepared the federal income tax returns? I did prepare the federal income tax return. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank no you. further questions. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes the oral hearing for today. Uh, we, just to recap, we are not closing the record. We're going to leave it open to allow uh, CDTFA to provide submissions. Uh, I will issue an order uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. Um, you indicated a week, but I'll give you till next Friday um, or a reasonable amount of time in the order that I'll be issuing. And I'll also be providing uh, Mr. Azir an opportunity to respond to the new submissions. Okay, is that understood? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the oral hearing is now adjourned. Thank you, and this is the last one for the day. We're off the record. Thank you.